I have no idea how many dimensions we actually inhabit. What I do know is that in our common experience, the spatial universe that we understand is three-dimensional. We recognize height, length, and width. And the interesting thing about those dimensions, which we take for granted, is that you can move both directions in each of those three dimensions. You can move up and down in the height dimension. In the length dimension, you can move forward and backward. In the width, you can move side to side. But that's not the case in what we understand to be the fourth dimension. Time moves in only one direction, from the past to the present to the future. And that one directional nature of time's flow is what we call time's arrow. But what is less clear is why time's arrow only points one way. Why can we move back and forth in any other dimension that we understand? And yet in the time dimension, the flow is always inexorably from the past to the future, never the other way. Well, as you might guess, there are some theories about why that's the case. And today I'm going to present you with a few of the most common and the most influential of those theories. The first theory is currently probably the most influential, and many of the other theories seem to hinge on this a little bit, and that's called the thermodynamic arrow of time. This has to do with the laws of thermodynamics. Now, thermodynamics, very briefly, is the study of the way that energy is transferred within a system, and entropy is a measurement of the amount of thermal energy in a system unavailable to do work. The way we commonly understand entropy, though, is as disorder. According to the second law of thermodynamics, the disorder within a system always increases. Order does not spontaneously increase because entropy always increases. You go from a state of order to a state of disorder. That's why buildings don't spontaneously build themselves. That's why eggs, once they're cracked, don't spontaneously uncrack. Now this can be confusing because you'll see, for example, that an acorn becomes a majestic oak tree. Uh, an embryo becomes a fetus, becomes an infant, becomes an adult. All of these would seem to violate the second law of thermodynamics. The key is though the total entropy of the system is always increasing. When you see an acorn become an oak, you know it has involved a significant input of energy from outside that acorn. And as many of you might know, to change from an embryo to a fetus and go all the way to an adult, involves a huge amount of energy being input into the system. In the universe, the total entropy is always increasing. Since entropy only moves in one direction, time only moves in one direction. Entropy never spontaneously reverses. And so that, very briefly, is the thermodynamic arrow of time theory. Because entropy always moves in one direction toward a state of greater entropy, greater disorder, Time also only moves in one direction. The next theory about the unidirectional nature of the arrow of time is what's called the causal arrow of time. That is that causes always precede effects. We don't see things going that way. Movies aside, bad fiction aside, we do not see effects preceding causes. So to use one fairly morbid example, Marie Antoinette's head does not fall into the basket before the guillotine strikes her neck. The guillotine falls, strikes her neck, her head falls into the basket. The cause precedes the effect. The rock first hits the window before the window shatters because the rock caused the window to shatter. And because of that unidirectional nature of cause and effect, time's arrow only moves in one direction. If time moved backwards, then the effect would precede the cause which of course wouldn't make any sense. Now there's one proviso I have to point out with this theory. That is that cause and effect may be psychological constructs. I think Hume was the first one to point this out. We assign cause and effect based on the order in which we see things happen. We see the sun come up, the air gets warmer. We assign the sun as the cause for the effect of the air getting warmer. We see the rock hit the window, we see the window break. We assign the rock hitting the window as the cause for the breaking of the window. If by some strange occurrence, we did see Marie Antoinette's head fall into the basket, King Louis XVI's head fall into the basket, Robespierre's head fall into the basket, all of them fell into the basket before the guillotine descended, 
then we would assign the head falling into the basket as the cause for the guillotine descending. We can never get to the underlying metaphysical reality behind cause and effect, as Hume pointed out. But that is wandering off into the weeds a little bit. The world we inhabit, the universe that we live in, causes precede effects. And that causal one directional nature gives time's arrow its direction. The third theory I want to cover is the cosmological arrow of time. The cosmological theory about the arrow of time has to do with the fact that the universe is only expanding. According to current science, and thank you Paul Sutter for this analogy, 13.77 billion years ago, the universe was the size of a peach at one quadrillion degrees, and it has been expanding ever since. It only moves in one direction, and that one directional expansion of the universe from the size of a peach to now 13.77 billion years later, a universe that is 46.5 billion light years in radius, that's just the known universe, that one-way expansion gives time its arrow. As the universe is inexorably expanding, time is inexorably marching on toward the future. Good news about that is all you would have to do to reverse time's arrow, to travel backward in time, would be to shrink the entire universe. The next theory for the arrow of time is what's called the radiative arrow of time. Not the radioactive, the radiative arrow of time. That has to do with the fact that when you throw a rock into a pond, waves ripple outward. They are divergent. They expand from the point of impact. When I emit sound waves, they expand outwardly from me. When the sun emits rays, they expand out into the solar system. They don't go back in toward the center of the sun. My sound waves do not go back in toward my larynx. Now, there have been some successful attempts to create what's called a convergent sound wave in a laboratory. But in general, there is a one directional radiative pattern of waves. And that one directional pattern of radiating out is what gives time its arrow. The fifth theory is what we call the quantum arrow of time. Changes in quantum systems are often governed by symmetrical equations that work the same forward or backward in time. But wave function collapse, collapse of the superposition, as we called it in our Schrodinger's cat and our quantum entanglement episodes, is one directional. So just going back to Schrodinger's cat video, when the box is open, the observer effect collapses the wave function, and the cat that is both dead and alive becomes either dead or alive. It doesn't go the other way. The cat's not alive in the box. You open the box and the observer effect causes superposition to occur and the cat suddenly becomes dead and alive. No, it's the other way around. The dead alive superposition collapses into either dead or alive. And very simply, it's the same thing with the electron spin. As both upspin and downspin until it's observed, then that wave function collapses into either upspin or downspin. And that one directional nature of the collapse of superposition, and yes, some of the other processes in quantum science, is what gives time its arrow. It only goes one way. The last thing I wanna talk about is the psychological arrow of time. And this has to do with all of our shared and lived experience. All of us understand that there is a difference between the past, which lives in memory, and the future, which we can't remember. We can form memories of events in the past. They can change our neural patterns. If we have any experience at all regarding events in the future, it's through our will. We cannot remember them. So all of us live in a world where the past is very different from the future. We also understand that we can't influence or change the past. We can't go backwards and make things happen differently than they happen. And yet we can affect, we can change. Our volition, our will can change our future. So we can affect the future, which we cannot remember, and we can remember the past, which we cannot affect. That's what's called the psychological arrow of time. It's also at times one of the very painful things about the human condition, let's face it. You can probably trace this arrow of time back to other physical laws. 
And yet this is our experience of time. This is how we understand the arrow of time, by the very clear distinction between the past and the future. This is why visions and prophecy or time travel to change the past are so emotionally appealing to us. In this discussion, we've covered these six theories about why the arrow of time only moves in one direction. You can see how difficult, if not just plain impossible, a proposition time travel would be. If you have to reverse the entropy of an entire system just to travel backward in time, think of the massive input of energy that would take. You have to reverse the nature of cause and effect, the radiative nature of wave patterns. I'm not saying it's impossible, and one day we may figure that out. It's possible the universe will expand to a certain point and begin contracting, and time will begin running in reverse. I'm just saying, as things are right now, time travel seems to be an extremely, exceptionally, uniquely difficult proposition.